you get ready for family Christmas time, what can you do to plan? It's probably exciting to think about getting together with sons, daughters, grandchildren, all of those special relatives. Well, for Tom and Andrea all, when they made the decision that they were going to spend Christmas with their daughter, Melanie, and her family, planning took on a whole new meaning. Tom and Andy are joining us to talk about their recent trip to Africa, which is where Melanie, her husband Don, and four kids have lived for several years. Let's talk about this unique Christmas trip that you took just a few months ago. Um, Tom has been after me to go, and he said, we have to go, we have to go, and I was very negative about it, to be honest, because we've been to Africa. Africa is very harsh, and um, we've left, and we've been very glad to leave, <laughs> actually, and so I was not anxious, and I just felt God, though, this year said, this is it. This is the year you have to go. The children have been there since March. They weren't returning until May. So it was over a year, and it was our turn, I guess, to go. <laughs> so off we went. We usually have our biggest sale of the year at the end of, end of the year. So, you know, I was like, oh, why don't we just wait till January, you know? And, of course, the tears started coming down over here. <laughs> and we want to be there for Christmas, you know, so... Anyway, it was just interesting how God worked all that out. So Don and Melanie are missionaries in Liberia. They Correct. got four children over there. And so for 15 days, including travel time, the two of you made this trip over to Africa. Um, mm -hmm. And as you started preparing, you weren't just packing for yourselves. You were packing because you were taking items that they needed, weren't you? Talk about the whole preparation that was involved to make this happen. Well, in one way, it's a lot of fun and it's exciting to think that you're bringing stuff that they really need and, um, and you want to get the list. And of course, getting the list is a challenge because they just getting their, them to send one is a challenge. Uh, but we got the list. Well, actually, you got the list. we got nonstop lists and that's what made it very complicated. <laughs> yeah, they came true. by email, they came by text, they'd come by phone calls. Oh, by the way, mom. <laughs> We need this, and it was very difficult to be sure not to remember anything. But the um, grandchildren did not know we were coming, oh. so that was a surprise. Oh. And um, Don told them that they were going to the airport to pick up some friends that were going to be spending some time there, but not with them. So the children, as soon as they learned somebody was coming from the States, started sending out their lists as well, because anytime anybody comes, you know, they want, of course, items that are over here and Christmas was coming and they were so anxious to give gifts to each other and their parents oh. and that was on their list it was so touching <laughs> so you packed of course your own items that you would need for the trip you in between there <laughs> the Christmas gifts that they were going to give to each other and then did you also pack supplies and things that they would need and Christmas things for them but yeah yeah they uh, Don had uh, had this desire to give each person a little one of these little recorders that he trains that are um, that have the Bible on them and uh, they're solar powered so you don't have to have electricity and so we had a lot of those we had I think a hundred and some of those electrical things I mean all kind of things that you know they just can't get there yeah. uh, so we had six trunks full of stuff I was just gonna ask how did you get this six trunks so you flew and six trunks flew along with you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> did. Um, actually, also, they have solar power, and they had lost their 110 um, voltage, is that what mm -hmm. it's called? Mm -hmm. And so we were also taking over a transformer. So transformer and these, uh, those little, I think there are like 300 of them, actually. They both weighed quite a lot, like 25 pounds each. You only allowed 50 pounds to a bag, so you have to be very, very careful how you do pack. Hmm. So you got everything there, despite we the did. fact that we is amazing, a miracle because the you know in Africa you can't, you know the just getting them off the plane, people come and take things you know really? what they want. So we're very thankful that we got everything there. Well, God was God was traveling right along with it. Got His angels holding on to those things to make sure that they got where they needed to go. Right. Well, we're going to talk about Don and Melanie's mission work in a moment, but first let's talk about Liberia. You mentioned that just getting it off the plane is a challenge because of uh, the, 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 the things you, you can't trust people. You, you don't know what you're getting into. And once you got to Liberia, you really recognized that the living conditions were so different than what we have here in the United States. What are your thoughts once you got there and 
unpacked and got ready to spend a couple weeks in this foreign country. <laughs> well, you, I kept thinking, well, what if we could catch the next plane back? <laughs> <laughs> He did. He did. <laughs> now he's talking about, I can't wait to go back. And I'm like, you don't remember. <laughs> well, what would cause that to happen? Obviously, it was a different lifestyle immediately. Culture shock immediately. I mean, all the roads are dirt. Um, the roads are very rough and uh, very, very hot. And the sun is, is amazingly. And uh, of course, food is not as this challenge, you know, you can't just go to the refrigerator and get what you want, no pop, um, no stuff like, like that. So, and we walk in Melanie's house and the, you know, the little Christmas tree that she's, they've tried to put together is over in the corner of this dark room. And I don't know, I just had some tears of, oh my goodness, how they live, you know. Uh, but it was. Describe their house a little bit. What is their house is very dark because of, first of all, it's built out of mud bricks because the people use for their homes what's around them. They are very environmentally correct, <laughs> we'll say, in a sad way. Mm -hmm. And then if you're a little bit more wealthy, then you'll put plaster over the mud bricks. And so the interior of the house was white on the walls, but with hardly any windows and the lights that they do have are possibly maybe 60 watt and you'll have one in a huge room you know that doesn't do much good and it's just very 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 dark was my first impression how can they live like this all the time mm -hmm. um, they don't have any running water that's huge when they told us that they didn't have running water i knew that that would not be an easy way to live but it wasn't until we went there that I really understood how exhausting it is and how time consuming it is and how hard it is to live without running water. Um, they hire a gentleman, the well is only open from four to six, it's about half a mile away maybe possibly. They hire a gentleman, he starts out about 350 with four or five gallon jugs, he brings it back and then Melanie, who's 5'1", very, very, very little, picks these jugs up and starts putting them inside the home in like 55 gallon drums. They have two of those and they have one about half as large in their bathroom that they shower with and wash their hands with. Um, which is even interesting because you can't contaminate all that water when you wash your hands. So you have to even do that very carefully. You have to get the water out, rinse your hands, soap them up, dip it in, use it over here so that you don't put that dirty water back into the water that everyone else is going to be using for their baths later. Um, you have a underneath their sink. We kept going to the sink to wash our hands. What do you know? <laughs> no water, <laughs> which was interesting. But when you do the dishes, um, it'll take like seven or eight trips, um, getting water, rinsing the sink, washing the sink, going back, rinsing the sink, and then filling the sink, and it leaks. And in between, you have a bucket underneath, and you have to keep draining that. Um, over to the um, toilet that's in the bathroom. You dump that's that. You, you dump. It. You lift this thing up, and of course, there's there's a there's a she's got a little mat underneath here, and of course, when you're lifting it up, it's very heavy, and of course, you spill a little bit, <laughs> not wanting to, but yeah. you do, and then you go to to the restroom, and you have to pour it carefully in. So for us to sit and talk about these things, we're, you know, we're almost aghast to realize that this is daily life but for them this is normal and not just for them but for everybody in that community mm -hmm. this is normal I, I don't even I, I guess I'm I'm not even my next thought is wow how do they get their food because there's probably you probably can't go to the grocery store every day well, the and first, pick it up they only got a car this trip and so this trip we ate a little bit like Americans we from cans we had spaghetti, we had spaghetti sauce, we would have um, fettuccine and stuff. But Don, in fact, said he didn't even think you could get anything like that in Africa because they didn't have a car and they didn't realize Monrovia had it. But when they got a car and they got to Monrovia, they went, oh my goodness, look at the food we could eat wow. now. But until then, they just got a stove um, about a year ago as well. And so before that, they even were cooking outside over open fire. And it's just having a car. There's yeah, been they a would. Huge uh, unfortunately, they would eat all kind of things. Animals that would brought people would bring to the door they could find that were killed. Uh, 
monkey, uh, all kind of rats and mm. stuff like that. And uh, they they were very undernourished the first year. Oh, wow. Very, very, very much. It mm. was sad that the kids just were were so the bone. You know, their arms were little skinny things. It was yeah. scary. But when they got home, that first we picked them up at the airport, went stayed overnight in a motel, and the next day. Our little Tommy, that was about six at the time, had so much food, you just wouldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, a lot of fun. So about nine years now, they've been in the mission field back and Getting forth. Getting ready to go. They haven't been there all the time, but they keep returning. Even if they mm -hmm. come back, they keep returning to these conditions that you're talking about, that this lifestyle, they're choosing to go there. There must be a bigger purpose. Yeah, I think, you know, the, when uh, the last one, before Melanie and Don left the last time, I lost, I, I couldn't find the girls anywhere, my daughter, my daughters. And they were up, Melanie was crying because she just couldn't face going back. And, uh, man, that's tough for a dad to mm -hmm. see, you know, your daughter uh, in that condition. But uh, so it was good for us to go there. She, with the car, they're much more they have so much more opportunity to get things that they need. And uh, so her life is, sh she says, is much, much better now. Uh, they also have a fence around their house. Uh, their house before was on a, the road went right through their back porch. Mm -hmm. So everybody, they, and they were constantly on view. People were looking in the windows nonstop. You do anything, you had people looking in the windows because they would leave the white people. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they got a fence around their house. And that was crazy that that, that little privacy, you just need some privacy, you know. You don't to have people const you constantly are on view. It was hard for Melanie to, to operate under those conditions. But uh, anyway. Um, actually, though, the actual mission of why they keep going back. Um, Don has a mission that was started with another organization, and now they um, go to, ha are with a mission called Hope for Homes, correct? But his the mission that he has is to provide a healthy church in every village in Liberia, and that's the goal. And so he heads out two days a week and teaches pastors in a very unusual way. Awesome, he is so passionate and he does such a good job. It's, you know, it's, it's God thing, uh, the way he teaches. He has a, he's hired a painter who paints the Bible stories and, uh, then he, he'll string a string across the room, and then he starts clipping these pictures as he's telling the stories. Mm -hmm. He's teaching these men how to do that. He's got about 100 men, I think, at this point that he's training. So he's equipping the church to grow in Liberia. Absolutely. Because of the illiteracy. With Liberians growing it themselves. Yeah, the, the illiteracy is a problem because that's why they're using these pictures. But then they also have orphanage ministries. Uh, they are caring for many, many orphans. And, uh, From Ebola. Mm, the huge. Ebola. Mm. And then he really goes after the ones that are disabled. They'll leave a disabled child just along the road, just like dump them off like, a, like somebody here might dump a dog out of their car. But they're, they're also building a, uh, they're just buying some land now to build a whole new orphanage compound. Mm -hmm. So that's one of their, so between the orphans and the pastor training, and then he works nonstop around his community. He's um, very community oriented and loved by his community, and he notices so much. He, every day he takes a walk, and every day he visits and just meanders, and people come up to him, and he notices their needs, and he notices when they're ill. And if he notices that one of them are ill, he'll give them a note and you take this to the clinic and tell them that I will be by later to pay. Mm -hmm. And they've been in the community long enough that the hospital knows that he will come by again and pay. And they get treatment. But, you know, if you don't have $5 for a malaria pill, you can die. It's actually a dollar to dollar. cure malaria. A and dollar. so many die of malaria there, it's amazing. Uh, so, you know, they're doing a great work right in their own community, plus and all these other things. and, and uh, like I say, he's probably the most passionate person I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So you know it's the right thing. You know God's hand is on this thing. Yeah. And who are we as, as parents to, to hold them back, you know? So it was, it was fun to 
fun to be with them and a blessing to see God, God working through these kids, you know. As you talk about the, uh, the positive things that God is doing through your family, I'm sure at the same time, it's hard. They're, they're so far away. Your grandchildren are far away. How, how can grandparents, parents be supportive when they know their children have been called, but it means they're gonna live halfway around the world? What, how do you do that? I think my personal journey, you can, I don't feel, it, it, you cannot tell someone how to handle it when their children are on the field, they have to figure it out for themselves. It's like telling someone how do you get through grief. You have to kind of just do it and it was support people around you. The first year that Melanie and Don went to Africa, I could not speak of them there the entire year without bawling, to be quite honest. And I just didn't talk about it. And if people asked me, I would turn around and say they're okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, the next year though, uh, you know, the first year it was like, God, how could you send them there? Okay. And then, then they came home for the summer, and then the next um, time that they were gone, God and I really, really struggled. And he really tried to teach me why they are there, and that it's okay that they're there, and that they're in his hands. And it drew me even closer to him mm -hmm. in a way that I hadn't been talking to him before. And then um, they'd been there this last year and I knew that we were probably gonna go visit them. So it was always the anticipation that they're only there for a short time and then we'll get to see them. And that was exciting. And then after having been there, totally changed my viewpoint mm -hmm. to where I miss them unbelievably, but they're happy and they are doing God's work. The children only, basically that's their home and that's the only, when they're here they talk about going home mm -hmm. and they mean their African home. And I now realize that this is God's will for them and how can I hold them back? Mm -hmm. And God will protect them. God will protect them, mm -hmm. yes. It's exciting to see their work. That's all, that going there really helped. Seeing the, the the excitement, enthusiasm of the kids, and and even Melanie, you know, she's come around and and uh, she's okay. You know. <laughs> well, I've yet to find any any calling on God that doesn't come along with some struggles. Mm. You know, it seems like every time God calls us to something, we need to be prepared for the other parts that are going along with it too, as we have to fight through those battles. But you get to the other side and see God's bigger picture and realize it was worth it all. Um, we'll know in heaven just how worth it all it was. If I were their age, uh, um, I would love to be, be where they are. Because it's, they've given up everything for the cause of Christ. And that is the most wonderful thing. Yeah. Amen. 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 Well, today I want you to be thinking about not just praying for Don and Melanie, you know, the Alls family, but praying for the other missionaries that maybe you know who have been called to go overseas. Pray for those families who have had to give them that blessing and know that they are doing the right thing, though they are so far away. Mission work is so very important, yet can come with so many struggles and sadness, just earthly sadness, not heavenly sadness, but earthly sadness as we feel the separation from our loved ones as they are doing this important work. We also pray for safety, safety for Don and Melanie and their children and safety for other missionaries that perhaps you know who are out in the field. Every single day, our missionaries need to have our prayers for them. And so today I encourage you, if you haven't been doing so, to start doing so. Tom and Andy, thank you for sharing your story. Is there anything that I missed? Anything else you want to share about it? Hmm. You probably do. That. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had many, many, many adventures, of course, when we were there, too. And we did see how the local people lived. Uh, one very, very, very exciting moment was when Don said, I want you to go with us while we teach, while he teaches. And he has a couple of friends that go with him. So we headed out on three motorbikes. <laughs> to the bush of Africa. And um, Don kept saying, I was behind him on his bike, and he kept saying, I never, ever, ever dreamed that I would have my mother-in-law with me on this adventure. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, your mother-in-law never dreamed that she'd be here either. <laughs> she came back totally, totally dirty. From, I mean, we were just totally covered with dirt. 
But it was like, and I, of course, I crashed on the motorcycle once. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, he did, and I happened to get it all on film. It was sort of exciting. <laughs> <laughs> they were driving down this, I mean, the roads are like a path. They go to these remote villages, and then they have a, a board that goes over a stream, and so you have to get the motorbike right over the board, and then it went up, and there was these rain, where the water drains down, and it was all gravel in there, and I got my bike tire in there, and, Bam, I was down so fast you couldn't believe it. And of course, when I went down, I turned the, the gas on, and of course the bike went <laughs> around, and it went over into the bush, into the sawgrass, and I, I'd never been around sawgrass. You cut, it cuts like you like can't saw, like a saw. Huh? Yeah. It does. Yeah, so I got cut up a little bit. And uh, anyway, the boys got the bike out, but we had brought over carefully this really nice brand new, um, well, what do you call it? Tour packed on the, for the back of his motorbike. They could put his Bibles in. He was so excited to get it. <laughs> yeah, and of course that thing broke right away. Oh no! Oh, no. <laughs> 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 we went back to a village that people didn't. I mean, they were all these little kids were. The children cried because they hadn't seen white people before. Really? Yeah. Did they come up to you? Did they come up? Well, and they they were some did. Oh. Some, some did. The, some of the older ones did, and but the little ones would stand behind their parents and one of them was bawling. Why is, why is crying? He's afraid of you. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> he, Don gave a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful message there in this little church that was just so, so awesome. The whole town crushed in around this church, got in there. It must have been 120 in there at least. The sun baking on these, on, it was a thatched roof, but it was still so... But it was a beautiful time, it really was. And it was a very long, long story because every time he said something, it had to be interpreted. So it was 120, 40 of us are in this very, very, very small building. Very, very, very hot. Tom and I had only had about half a glass of water all day um, because we were conserving it, you know, and we only well, had this you, much. You, don't want, you were afraid to drink anything particularly. Because mm. you didn't have a restroom either, yeah. <laughs> you know, around. And um, I, I was sitting there standing there, whatever, and I can honestly say I probably have never been more uncomfortable in my life. Okay. And it, just this past week, the pastor was telling us during the service that Jesus taught us how to suffer. And I thought, whoa, I wish I had thought of that when I was standing there in that um, little tiny itty bitty building. Because in, people suffer for Christ every day in ways that are much, much greater than we were suffering in much, much greater ways than even our daughter does and their life has improved so much. They kept saying, Mom, Mom, it's okay, because my life has improved so much. Mm -hmm. When they first went, they didn't have screens on the windows. Um, the snakes would just, you know, wander in at will. And now they've progressed to where they have a fenced-in yard, and they have um, so solar power, and they have a car, and they have fans at night now, and they have a little light at night, so they don't have to always wear their headlamps. So it's... It's all good, I guess, and God's in charge all the time. God's in charge, yes. And uh, many people who come to Christ, and I, th I know they're, I know He's using them. That's exciting. That is exciting. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you for sharing that. We appreciate hearing mm -hmm. it from the firsthand experience as well as from the parents who have blessed their children to go over and do this important work. God's in charge and God's will be done in all things. Incredible story about Don and Melanie and their mission work overseas in Liberia and Tom and Andrea All's great experience to be able to see it firsthand. <laughs>